Our guest today made history by becoming the first woman to serve as Attorney General in the state of Illinois. She is a community leader, lawyer, and educator. After receiving her bachelor's degree from Georgetown University, our guest today moved to Africa at the height of the apartheid struggle, serving as a volunteer school teacher to young Zulu women, helping them overcome racism, violence, and oppression through education. Prior to, prior to being elected Attorney General, our guest today served in the, Illinois, in the Illinois State Senate. Our guest today earned her law degree from Loyola University. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome back to the City Club of Chicago, the Attorney General, Lisa Madigan. Lisa? Thank you. Well, thank you. Please sit down. We only have about 25 minutes and I could talk for two days. Feel free to leave when you need to. As, uh, as Jay was kind enough to mention, I used to be a high school teacher and so it really won't offend me at this point if you leave, but if you were my students, I would certainly call you out. Well, to say the very least, it has been quite a year in my life. Um, as you know, in January, I was sworn in as Attorney General. In April, I got married, and in October, the Cubs were still playing baseball, and... Steve Neal said something nice about me in his column. <laughs> so truly, what a difference a year makes. You know, one of the surprising things and one of the frustrating things that I have learned this past year is that most people really don't know what it is the Office of the Attorney General does. And so what I would like to do today is to take this opportunity to explain to you the role that our office plays and really how I view my role as the Attorney General. So let's get through some of the basics. As of this morning, I have 642 employees. Uh, they are in seven offices throughout the state of Illinois. The vast majority of them, in fact, uh, 442 of them, which is about 69% of them, work here in Chicago. Uh, there are another 175 attorneys and staff that are in Springfield, which is our second largest office. That's about 27%. Uh, and then I have offices in Northern Illinois, in Rockford. I have one in Western Illinois, in Quincy. I have one in Carbondale. I have one in Belleville, which is the East St. Louis area. And I have an office in Champaign. Uh, the staffs of those offices are relatively small. And out of the total number of employees I have, uh, they tell me that as of today, 274 of them, which is about 42% of them, are lawyers. The total budget for the Office of the Attorney General right now, well actually when I started it was about 64 million. Ron, it's now down to about 62 million. <laughs> the legal functions in the office are divided into three different divisions. We have a civil division, we have a criminal division, and we have an appeals division. Our consumer division probably houses the office that is known most about. And, and I've learned that if people know anything about the Office of the Attorney General, they recognize that we take consumer fraud complaints. And in fact, Pat Kelly, who's way in the back of the room, is with us today. She is head of the consumer protection area in the office. And let me give you a sense of the volume of consumer fraud complaints we handle. Over 24,000 consumer fraud complaints are filed with our office every single year. It is a phenomenal amount uh, to handle, but it is something that we take great pride in doing. So feel free, continue calling the office, continue sending us things in the mail. You can email us at our website, www.ag.state.il.us. We're happy to have more complaints. I know some of you in the audience aren't happy when we get those complaints. 
but we're quite happy to have them. I also have a charitable trust division that uh, works with some of you in the audience as well. We deal with the 27,000 charities that are registered here in the state of Illinois. I have a little known healthcare bureau, but my healthcare bureau mediates approximately 3,000 healthcare complaints every year. These are individuals who are having a problem usually with an HMO or their insurance company. So we do a lot of work on that front. Uh, I have a public utilities bureau that uh, Ed Hurley and others here know a lot about. Our public utilities bureau is very small and we, on behalf of citizens of the state of Illinois, uh, go before the ICC usually as interveners in rate making cases. We have a very large and proactive environmental division that Nick can tell you about from his role on the Pollution Control Board. Uh, we file about 200 cases a year, and currently we have been very proactive in some national litigation addressing uh, the scope of the Clean Air Act, which I will hope to get to a little bit later. Uh, really the big kahuna of the office is the Government Representation Division. Uh, it's kind of overwhelming, as, as you know, really my statutory role is to be a lawyer for the state of Illinois. And that means representing not just the constitutional officers, but it also means representing all the different state agencies and all those employees uh, in their day-to-day -day work. Every year we get approximately 15,000 cases referred to us. And right now we have an open caseload of 25 thousand cases in the Government Representation Division. In fact, for those of you who are thinking of asking, uh, at 2.30 today, Judge Madden is scheduled to rule on uh, cross motions for summary judgment and our motion to dismiss in the Judicial Cola case. So don't bother asking. You'll hear about it as the day rolls on. Uh, revenue litigation, an exciting part of our office, particularly for people who are concerned with the state budget, because every single month we bring in millions of dollars uh, in taxes that are owed to the state of Illinois. We also have some real exciting things that take place in our civil area. We have a civil rights division, and because I was able to lure Pat Mendoza away from MALDEF uh, to head up that division, we're getting involved in some very interesting cases. Uh, we also have revitalized the Disability Rights Bureau uh, that is part of our Civil Rights Bureau, and I'm very excited about that, and if uh, we have a chance, we'll talk a little bit about the Walgreens case. Special litigation, another exciting area that at this point deals with all kinds of special things, but really uh, the bulk of the work that tends to get done out of that area is our constant monitoring of the Master Settlement Agreement, which is the settlement for the national tobacco litigation. And so that generates constant monitoring and uh, constant battles at a national level. Our criminal area is much smaller than our civil area, but still we do some amazingly significant work. We have a trial assistance bureau that goes out and helps state's attorneys throughout the state of Illinois, but primarily in counties outside of Cook and the Collar counties. In some of the smaller counties where you might only have the elected state's attorney, you may not even have an assistant. Maybe there will be one or two assistants. So when there is a murder case, uh, in this summer, in fact, we took two of our lawyers and sent them to Dixon for their summer vacation to try a triple murder case. They were there for six weeks living in a lovely new hotel, uh, but you know, obviously they weren't very happy to spend their summer vacation essentially in Dixon, but this is the work that our office does uh, to make sure that we secure convictions against criminals who have committed heinous crimes and frequently in the state, when the state's attorneys need our help, they turn to our office and we do that for them. We also have a Sexually Violent Persons Bureau, which is very important. I'm going to get into some of the sex offender legislation and uh, litigation that we contend with, but we have a statute here in Illinois that allows the Attorney General, when there is a sex offender that is scheduled to be released from prison, it allows us to determine if they are simply too dangerous to be back in our community. Uh, we can then civilly commit them, uh, and then the Department of Human Services takes over. And so we have almost 300 cases of that nature in our office right now. We also have uh, something that every state needs to have and everybody needs to be aware of at this point, and that is a high-tech crimes bureau. Uh, we deal with spam, we deal with identity theft, uh, but the issue that we contend with that I think is the most important is dealing with sex predators 
on the internet. And I'm going to give you uh, some words of wisdom about that because for those of you who happen to have computers in your home, because you have kids and you think you're being a great parent by letting them have an online computer in their room and they're teenagers, take it away. Let them have a computer, let them have internet access, but do it in a common room where they don't know when someone's going to be walking through because sex offenders these days are not just, you know, the creepy people that we were told about growing up, stranger danger who was lurking around, flashing people in a trench coat at the park. They've now moved to the internet. And if you've ever been in a teen chat room, there are no teens in teen chat rooms. There are sex offenders in teen chat rooms. And you've really got to watch out about your kids and what they're doing because looking around this room, there are very few of us, and I'm actually not even one of those few, who grew up learning about computers. And so we tend to say, oh, you know, our kids will be fine. They know what they're doing. We don't. We have to know and we have to monitor what they're doing. Please be careful on that front. Our appeals division. Very exciting and very busy. Uh, right now, we have a fabulous individual, Gary Feinerman, who uh, is our Solicitor General. About two and a half weeks ago, he argued his first case in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. He is a former clerk for Justice Kennedy on the Supreme Court. And I can tell you from watching the argument, they don't cut any slack to their former clerks. And uh, for those of you who have not had an opportunity, if you ever do get the chance, go and watch a U.S. Supreme Court argument. They're very lively. Uh, they're very interesting. And I have to publicly say that while I may not agree with Justice Scalia politically, he's really funny in the courtroom. <laughs> and that was well worth, you know, just, just going there for that. Um, we have filed almost 450 civil appeals so far this year. We're on pace to file approximately 560 of those. Uh, we have over 1,000 criminal appeals cases pending. So there, there's a lot going on in the office, and, and I wanted to make sure you had a sense of really the volume and, and the breadth of the work that we handle. Uh, but really, what you want to know, and really I think maybe the main reason I'm here, is to talk to you about my role as the Attorney General and how I view that role. And it's very simple for me because I really view my role as being an advocate, a litigator, and a negotiator on behalf of all the people of the state of Illinois. So as an advocate, I have this great thing called a bully pulpit. And I have used it um, in a lot of different ways, but one of the ways I've used it, and there are a lot of people that do this work every day that are in the audience, is I've really tried to use it to protect people from family violence. Um, and let me tell you some of the reasons, or you know, illustrate for you some of the reasons I've made this a priority. Last month was Domestic Violence Awareness Month. October is always Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And one of the things that my office did to highlight family violence, we, uh, for those of you who've seen it, you know, but for those of you who haven't, we put up a display of what are known as the silent witnesses. And these are cutouts, they're silhouettes of women, children, and this year actually there was a man as well, of people who have been victims of domestic homicide. And so we had this display up in the Thompson Center and I went down one day as I was on my way out to a meeting but I wanted to see what the display looked like. And there were a lot of people, I was surprised, there were a lot of people that are reading the stories because on these silhouettes they've got their stories of what happened to these people. And there was a woman who came up to me and she just finished reading one of the stories and she came up to me and she grabbed my hand and she said, I just want you to know that this is so important because my sister was killed by her husband. And I can tell you that every single time I speak about domestic violence, I speak about family violence issues, there will be someone. There will be a woman in the crowd, there will be a waiter, there will be somebody who comes up to me afterwards pulls me aside, whispers in my ear, and just says, thank you. Thank you because that is something that they grew up with. Thank you because it's something that happened to one of their relatives or one of their friends. Thank you because it really does save lives for us to recognize this issue and to talk about it and to provide resources. Unfortunately, domestic violence, family violence, it's a crime, and it needs to be treated that way. Uh, in the last few weeks, I have uh, gone to Bloomington to speak about the relationship between domestic violence and firearms in the home, because in domestic violence situations, very quickly, 
If there's a gun in the house, it can escalate to a domestic homicide. Uh, I was in Naperville because one of the cutting edge issues is teen dating violence. Here in the city of Chicago, I believe that there are two high schools where they've done surveys, and in those surveys, tw approximately 25% of the teenage girls have indicated that they have experienced some form of violence in a dating relationship. Teenagers, we have to break that cycle and we have to do it sooner rather than later or else it goes on for the rest of somebody's lives. Elder abuse. Uh, we were in Tinley Park a few weeks ago. We did an elder justice conference. Family members are abusing, physically abusing, physically neglecting their own family members, their own mothers, their own fathers, their own grandparents. And in those circumstances, 25% of the victims are men. It's not just women. And so we see that there is violence taking place across people's lives. And again, we need to do all we can to contend with that. Let me move to another issue that I think actually demonstrates very well uh, the ability that I have as the Attorney General to continue a lot of the work that I was able to do as a state senator. So as the Attorney General, not only do you get a bully pulpit to advocate from, but you also have the ability to propose and to pass significant legislation. Uh, for those of you who paid attention to the campaign or had to, regardless if you wanted to or not, you heard me talk a lot about the need that we have here in Illinois to strengthen our system of supervision of sex offenders. So especially once these people are released from prison. There are a handful of states in the country, Arizona, Colorado, and some others, that are ahead of us. But we need to look at some of the innovative steps they've taken, some of the approaches that they have used to really reduce the exceedingly high rate of recidivism among sex offenders. Um, and this is, again, is a way that my role as an advocate and as a lawyer come together. After taking office, I had the opportunity to spend and really immerse myself in a lot of the work that the Sex Offender Management Board does, because my office helps coordinate those efforts. And I want to put in context uh, the problem we have here in Illinois with sex offenders for you. There are currently over 15,600 registered sex offenders living here in the state of Illinois. And in this fiscal year, so maybe a better way to, in this, well, I'll do it two ways. In this fiscal year, there will be uh, 1,200 sex offenders that will be released from the Department of Corrections back into our communities across the state of Illinois. Every single county in the state of Illinois has registered sex offenders. But the real issue is every single county, every single town in the state of Illinois has many more people who are not registered sex offenders because we never apprehend them. And so when we start talking about, and I start seeing these recidivism studies, you have to put this in context. So even the Department of Corrections here in Illinois will say that the number in terms of the recidivism rate is somewhere between 44% and about 46%. So I tend to round that up to say, you know, about 50% of sex offenders are going to reoffend. Those studies only capture people that we have managed to apprehend, to charge, and convict, not just once, but twice. And because so much of this is taking place in homes, we never, as law enforcement, hear about it. These people are never charged. They're never convicted. And so we have many, many more sex offenders in homes and in communities than we're going to find out about. And let me give you some very startling numbers. The Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault estimates that a sex offender who rapes women has an average of seven victims. A sex offender who rapes or molests children has an average of 76 victims. Yeah, doesn't that put that in perspective? Um, you know, long prison sentences are always going to be critical when it comes to dealing with these criminals, but the reality is the vast majority of these people are going to be re-released into our communities. And given that they will be released, any expert will tell you that we really need to evaluate their risk, provide people with treatment, and then supervise them in their communities. That's the only way we can effectively reduce this rate of reoffense. Uh, 
some of you, and I want to thank publicly Steve Neal and others in this room who were very helpful editorially in working with us on House Bill 3556. We introduced a bill into the legislature this year that required mandatory evaluation and mandatory treatment for sex offenders. Uh, we were able to override a mandatory veto with great success. I think it was 115 to 1 in the House, 58 to nothing last week in the Senate. And so that is now going to be law here in the state of Illinois. That is the first piece, however, to putting in place broader supervision once people are released back into communities and we have to be watching out for them. So during the month of October, we held five hearings throughout Illinois. We started in Carterville, and a 20-year-old woman got up and very emotionally testified that between the ages of 7 and 14, she was repeatedly raped by her father. When she finally told a relative, the relative said to her, we know. The relative said to her, it's happened to other people in the family too. You're not the only one. So eventually they went to law enforcement. And this woman testified to the fact that she was the one who was treated as the criminal. She was the one who had to get treatment. She was the one who had to get counseling. Her father never got treatment. Her father never had to go to counseling. He's the criminal. He's the one who should have had to go through that. So we are now starting to craft legislation to address this issue of lifetime supervision. We will start to roll that out in the spring legislative session. But I want to make sure that I don't have to listen to more and more of these terrible and tragic stories because it impacts children, it impacts women, not just when it happens, it impacts them throughout the rest of their lives. Okay, what do I do as a litigator? Let's, let's try to get this a little more upbeat again. Uh, as a litigator, let me give you some of the highlights. I mentioned earlier that uh, Gary Feinerman, our new Solicitor General, got to argue his first case in front of the U.S. Supreme Court a few weeks ago. Uh, in March, we had a great success. It was uh, another case in front of the U.S. Supreme Court called uh, Telemarketing and Associates. Telemarketing and Associates is a for-profit fundraising entity that uh, in 1991, former Attorney General Roland Burris decided to sue. And he decided to sue them because, and if anybody truly, we are going to get to 115 soon. If you guys need to leave, I'll be here talking for a few minutes past then. Um, he decided to sue this organization because they had contracted with uh, a good organization, an organization called Vietnam. Vietnam was raising money to help Vietnam War veterans to make sure that they had job training, make sure that they were, have, had food baskets and were able to take care of themselves. And telemarketing associates would call you. They would call you and they would say, hi, we're calling on behalf of Vietnam. We'd like to, you know, raise some money to help Vietnam veterans. And you would think, well, that's a reasonable thing. I'd like to help the cause. You would write them a check. Telemarketing and Associates would keep $85. When the rest of that $15 was passed along to Vietnam, Vietnam was keeping approximately half of it. At the end of the day, 7 or $8 of every $100 was actually getting to the people that they claimed needed the money and that they were working on behalf of. And so Roland Burr, as attorney general, said, this is fraud. You know, if I ask somebody directly, well, what are you doing with the money? And you tell me you're providing food baskets and job training to Vietnam veterans, but in fact, you're just keeping it? You're perpetrating a fraud on the people. Well, wonderfully, this case went all the way up through the court system here in Illinois, and the attorney general's office lost every step of the way. But when it got to the US Supreme Court, our argument was essentially this. The First Amendment cannot possibly protect fraudulent statements made by telemarketers. And that was really what they were trying to argue. Well, we have a First Amendment right to say this. Well, you don't have a First Amendment right to commit fraud. And in a nine to nothing decision, the, uh, the US Supreme Court agreed with us. And so I hope that that provides some better protections to people when they decide that they are going to give money to a charity. If you directly ask the charity, they can't lie to you. And if they do lie to you, call us because we always like more cases. Um, obviously, I could spend hours talking about uh, cases, but let me give you a few more key cases to give you a sense of my priorities. I mentioned earlier the Clean Air Act. And uh, for those of you who read the papers, for those of you who don't and are just concerned about the environment, as you know, the Bush administration has gone through a series of rule changes uh, of the Clean Air Act in an attempt 
the way I view it and many others across the country view it, to really gut the protections that were put in place by the Clean Air Act in the 1970s. President Nixon signed the Clean Air Act, and for those of you who are slightly older than I am, you may remember Bill Scott, uh, another predecessor of mine, really was on the forefront of using the Attorney General's office to protect the environment. Well, we find ourselves at a sort of a pre-1970s mode right now because really over the years until the Bush administration, and I don't mean this as, as a partisan political attack, I truly mean it as a concern for the environment, we are now in a position right now where we have got to try to just keep in place what has been there for well over 30 years. Feel free to cheer whenever you want. <laughs> join, join Curtis. And so we're in a position, and here's why. I mean, you know, yes, we all have a general concern about the environment. We have a general concern about clean air. But in the city of Chicago, we have asthma rates twice that of the national average. The number one reason in the state of Illinois that children miss school is because of asthma. I think the number one reason children in the state of Illinois go to the hospital is because of asthma. Uh, it's really important and I'd say vital for us to protect the environment. So we're doing all kinds of great things on that front. Um, let me briefly talk about Walgreens since I mentioned it as well. Um, Walgreens is a fine Illinois company. Uh, but Walgreens also has been a longtime violator of the Illinois Environmental Barriers Act here in our state. That is essentially the state law that is very similar at the federal level to the ADA, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. You think it would be common sense that people who own stores, and it's not just Walgreens, uh, but there are many other people out there, many other companies out there, you want everybody to be able to get into your store and you want to be able to sell them your product. Well, over the years, over the past 10 years, we have had consistent and ongoing uh, violations by Walgreens. Our office has tried for years to work with Walgreens to get them to resolve these complaints. And at some point, as the Attorney General, you just have to look up and say, we're filing a lawsuit because of the 79 stores that we went and looked at, there were violations at 69 of them. And they refused to enter into a timetable to make these repairs. And basically over the years, they have simply refused on a grand scale to do what has to be done under the laws here in the state of Illinois. So that is ongoing um, and exciting, although unfortunate, litigation. Okay, here's my wrap up. My role as negotiator, for those of you who haven't read the papers or seen TV for the past two weeks, um, you know that I have a role that is very different uh, from that of an attorney in private practice. Because as a negotiator, while I have clients such as the Illinois Gaming Board, I also have a role in protecting and looking out for the interests of all the people in the state of Illinois. And I really view that as the highest calling, the highest priority of my job. So this becomes particularly obvious when we contend with issues such as Emerald Casino. Um, you all know the background. Uh, the background is that there are a number of people who invested in that 10th casino license, uh, the Emerald Casino. It was initially on the Mississippi River. It got into financial trouble, so there was legislation that I voted against, for the record, to move that casino to Cook County, potentially. Allegations of serious misconduct by uh, the shareholders, by some of the officers. And then the gaming board had been working for a good number of years. And, and what are they going to do? Go to a disciplinary hearing. They initially started a revocation hearing. Uh, ended up, and now there's a, the situation is in bankruptcy court because Emerald eventually went bankrupt. And so, you know, in this mess, in May, the Illinois Gaming Board had negotiated its most recent uh, settlement, which has to be a plan of reorganization because, as I mentioned, this asset, this license is all currently in bankruptcy court. And so, saw the settlement, looked up and said, you know what, the settlement really does not maintain or provide for the people of the state of Illinois the knowledge that there will be integrity in gambling in the state. 
And so I had some major objections. I'm not going to go through all of them, but very briefly, it had long been discussed, well, wrongdoers shouldn't profit. Well, I think we have to send a much stronger message than that to the people of the state of Illinois. Wrongdoers, in fact, or alleged wrongdoers, should be punished. And that is what one of the changes that we negotiated does. Um, essentially, the state will receive approximately $22 million from this settlement, half of which will go to the state general revenue fund, half of which are going, is going to go to the Illinois Gaming Board for them to distribute to uh, anti-gambling programs, gaming addiction, gambling addiction programs, which I think is very significant. Um, another key component of this was making sure that any process put in place, any type of auction, was going to be open, fair, and competitive, and that it wasn't going to steer this license to Rosemont, but people were actually going to have an opportunity around the state to get together with legitimate investors and to make a proposal to the state of Illinois. And by doing that, we also wanted to make sure to insert the Illinois Gaming Board in this process. Because the way that the bid process was initially drafted, the Gaming Board didn't have final say. Emerald essentially had final say. So that they would then be able to go after the highest bid. But the highest bid in this instance may not necessarily be the best bid. Because we have to make sure that the location, we have to make sure that the investors are all going to be people who have no interest in violating the gambling laws here in the state of Illinois. So I think that with the settlement, uh, while it is not a perfect plan, and because it's in bankruptcy court and there will eventually be a vote on the plan, it does have to be one that someone's going to vote for. Uh, we're in a position to substantially say that it is much better uh, than any of the proposals that are out, were out there before, and it is certainly a proposal that I think uh, is good for all the citizens of the state of Illinois. So with that, and a round of applause, I officially have it at uh, maybe 18 after. So uh, Paul's going to come up here and moderate some questions. If anybody has any, otherwise, you're free to go back to work. <laughs> but thank you for being a kind audience. You must state your name. You move quick, Mike. Uh, and the name's legitimate. Uh, Michael Bauer. Um, Attorney General, what, what do you think has been the biggest challenge for your first year and the biggest surprises? I'm not trying to duck that question. I just want to the water down. Um, it's would actually, you like me to answer for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very simple answer to that question. Um, and maybe you'll get to hear more about this as the budget process continues. The biggest struggle that the office faces is simply the salaries for starting lawyers. New York Times article in September talked about a study where the average student graduated from law school has about $77,000 worth of debt. Our starting salary in the Attorney General's office is a whopping $35,000. And while some of you snicker, it's one thing to say, sure, in comparison to the private firms that start people at 100 to 120 or more thousand dollars a year, we know we can't compete with the private firms, but I am seven to $10,000 out of whack with the other public lawyers here in the city of Chicago and in Cook County. So Cook County State's Attorney's Office, Cook County Public Defender, uh, January 1st of this year, their starting salaries are going to be 43000 over $43,000. Uh, Corporation Council, about forty-four five, say, is where they're going to be starting. Uh, Public Guardian is even higher, uh, forty four seven. Uh, Pat Murphy does well for his people. Um, <laughs> U.S. Attorney's Office here in the Northern District, they're over 44000 as well. Um, even the state's attorneys in Rockford are making more starting, they're making 38 to uh, 39,000 starting salaries. So that's the biggest problem. It is attracting and retaining new lawyers. Uh, and frequently we contend with, you know, we have somebody in the general law division, they're working, they're doing great, and then other agencies in state government will steal them from us. You know, they'll give them 
10, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars more than we're able to pay. So uh, before this term is over, I hope to right that wrong. Thank you for Thank asking. You. <laughs> Joel Cohen, CEO, Richard Hoffman Corporation. It appears in a very short period of time you have more than exceeded your campaign promises. On a lighter side, I'd like to ask, I suspect the words we will never hear you utter are drunken sailors. <laughs> um, and I, I was just wondering, is that because you never liked Elvis that much or... I think for the media, we have a fine contender for some commentary here. Um, but as for me, you know, I, just, I play a different role. And so when I need to get involved in legislative matters, I have that ability. And when I don't need to be involved in political matters, you know, as you can see, I have plenty of things to do uh, on behalf of the people of the state. And I have the tools uh, to be able to do those things that need to be done. And, and I, uh, I prefer it that way. Jeff Berkowitz, host and producer of Public Affairs, airing every Monday night at 8.30 on Channel 21 throughout the city of Chicago. Tonight's guest, Now, Dave do you Rupert. pay for lunch to be able to do that? I do. <laughs> just checking. Just checking. So mostly I pay just to ask you a question. I know. Attorney General Madigan, uh, as you know, last month six people died in a fire at 69 West Washington. One of the issues that's been raised was the county's decision when it bought that building in 96 and renovated it for 20 to 25 million dollars not to uh, not to install automatic sprinklers not to have pressurized stairwells not to have an automatic unlocking mechanism for the doors putting aside whether that complied with the code or was grandfathered in some would suggest that there was an obligation on the county's part perhaps on the companies that are involved in the management of that building to provide a safe building. And some have questioned whether there was clout in the decision not to engage in those expenditures then or along the way. And although, as you know, in committees or commissions have been appointed by the governor and by, and, and, and by the Cook County, some have questioned not the integrity of those people involved, but the fact that they lack those commissions lack subpoena power. Some would say they don't view the issue I've just raised as the, an issue for them to get into. So as Attorney General of the state of Illinois, and I believe you do have subpoena power, and you have the power to convene a grand jury, even if you don't have anybody to indict at the moment, to investigate that issue, uh, it's been raised that uh, well, the question is, you've taken... Come on, Jeff. Your show would be over by now. <laughs> Jeff, I know the question you're asking. Let me comment well, on the que no, how question the fire is, has I, been handled. What, yeah, how, you, apparently you've decided not to do that. That's my understanding. Is that still under consideration? And could you talk a little bit about that, especially in light of the sensitive factor that's been alleged that people involved have conflicts here, that is, people have clout and have connectedness to you and others? Jeff, let me comment. Um, one, I'm not going to stand here as the Attorney General and opine um, on the first segment of your question uh, as to what the you know, building code required at the time and things of that nature. This was a horrible tragedy. Um, lives were lost, and it is arguable that uh, it was unnecessary for that to have occurred. The city uh, is grieved and continues to grieve, as do the families uh, and the coworkers and friends um, of those people whose lives were lost. Um, regarding my office and our subpoena power, our investigation power, in fact, we obviously looked at this the minute the fire happened. Uh, the statutes here in the state of Illinois provide that the state fire marshal, in fact, has full investigatory uh, ability and power. Uh, that is provided by state statute. And in order for me to have uh, a grand jury, as you state, over this matter, um, I would have to be granted that power from Dick Devine, from the state's attorney's office. Um, I believe that the people who the governor and the people who uh, the Cook County Board have brought in to do an investigation 
uh, have at this point shown no cause for us to be concerned about their fairness and impartiality. And at this point, I think what everybody needs to do here in Chicago and Cook County, and really for the entire state, is to make sure we find out what went wrong and to use those findings to make sure that we don't have another tragedy of that nature. And unfortunately, here in Chicago, there is a long historical history of tragic fires and public investigations and responses to them that have allowed us to move ahead and put in place protections and measures necessary to make sure that, again, those tragedies don't occur again. And I think there's no reason for us to believe that that won't be done in this case. Just one, <coughs> one quick follow-up. The fire marshal, state fire marshal that you referred to, as I understand it, his appointment recently did not go through because of criticism that he did not do enough at the time or since the time of the fire. Does that give you pause whether that's an appropriate reason for you to exercise some discretion and rely on that office? I was not in the Senate committee that uh, discussed that nomination, but from reading the newspaper articles, it seems that there is some political issue around that that I'm not qualified to comment on. Uh, all I am telling you that state statute provides that the Illinois State Fire Marshal does have power to investigate. Uh, obviously, the situation that uh, you refer to might cause an impediment of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, where's my mark? Thank you.